Good evening and welcome to NUFC Matters. It's Friday night, so it's three amigos night. So it's a big welcome to Mitch, to Steve Hasty, and uh, as always, we sometimes have our local MP on. It's Ian Mearns. Good evening, lads. Good evening, Steve. Steve. Good to see you all, and uh, it's been a busy, busy week. And as always, there's something usually drops on a Tuesday when Liam's on, or when the lads are on on a Friday. And uh, it is Liam's story in the Shields Gazette, which is going to dominate, I suppose, tonight's show. So if you haven't had time to read it, I'll uh, I'll whiz through it. It's uh, an interview and a very uh, interesting interview with uh, the man behind the Newcastle Consortium Supporters Limited, Mr. Keith Patterson. And he's revealed that the real reasons why he believes Newcastle United's takeover stalled. Speaking exclusively with Liam at the Gazette, the Shields Gazette, um, it, it, with Gordon Steen, he's taken the Premier League to court for what the NCSL see as potential breaches of anti-competition law, has dropped from Newcastle United to take up a bombshells today. And he's pointed the finger not only at the league, but also at top flight rivals Liverpool, Manchester City and Tottenham. Uh, he also revealed today his thoughts on the Premier League's nine-page response to NCSL's letter before action. The top flight's no red flags claim, and QC Robert O'Donoghue, his company's legal standing, called into question by many and takes aim at the Premier League Chiefs with a we are coming for you message. So his, his interview was really, really good today. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. And what, and what he basically said was, yeah, I was surprised by their letter. They didn't answer any of the competition charges I put against them. I'm very much looking forward to running them through a court because I am sure we will win the arguments and we only have to win one. If they've acted in any way against competition law, then they are in trouble. To quantify what trouble may be, directors can be struck off and fines range up to 10% of world turnover. That's significant for these levels of organisations. We are talking about the Premier League and some of their members and some of their associates. By real surprise, when the EPL wrote to us, we read, in, we read it in point 18 of our letter. It said Newcastle United had a law case with the Premier League. We were shocked. No one has made us aware of that. You hear rumours the QCs were lined up, but no one has confirmed to us that a case was running. And it sounds like this is going at snail's pace. Now that everyone can talk about it and confidentially has been broken by the Premier League, hopefully Newcastle United can accelerate that as well. We all certainly hope so. Why can't the Premier League have six cases running at them? Everyone all in one go. Why should we wait in line? That is their problem, not ours. We are being told by the Premier League to back away from our case while they fight another case. Call me a simple Geordie, if you like, but tell me this. If you robbed a bank in January and then you stole a car in August, can you tell the man who owned the car not to take you to court because you were busy dealing with the bank robbery case? Mm -hmm. Am I missing something? The club can get on with their case with a team of QCs, the best in the country. And I'll do mine. I'm challenging them on the competition law. Maybe they are trying to stop both of them. Maybe they are so determined to get Project Big Picture through, they'll fight both. Only time will tell on this one. But one thing is certain. If they have nothing at all to hide, then they ought to expedite both cases. So the fans need to hear that the club are getting full expedition to their case because already they have told us that they will not agree to expediting ours. Part of the consortium had already approached Liverpool before Newcastle. They walked away of their own accord. However, it was published. Liverpool walked away. Is there sour grapes there? Who knows? Why would Tottenham want, not want it to happen? I couldn't understand that. But we've seen information that explains why there is an obsession with the project big picture and why we feel there is such determination to stop PIF investing in Newcastle United. Tottenham Hotspur, in a negotiation which broke down in March 2019, approached investors in the region we are talking about two months before the Newcastle deal was ironed out to buy the football club for £2.5 billion with a further £1 billion in add-ons. The deal was taken to the investors in Saudi Arabia by a dealmaker named as Eldridge Investments and it was rejected. The whole deal totals £3.5 billion. Newcastle was set to be sold for one-tenth of that price. I have had that exact same information from three different credible sources. That concerns me. People are trying to prevent our deal going through, but we're trying to do a similar deal themselves for 10 times the amount. But I feel on this alone that the fans of both Spurs and Newcastle need to learn this so that they understand what is happening within their club. 
then we can go somewhere to appreciate why this willing buyer and willing seller cannot do a simple deal. At the very least, it adds to the intrigue. And in August, I wrote that Liverpool and Tottenham were opposed to the deal. My letter to Richard Masters, then in November, I got this information. Something is really not right with the whole thing. If one or more company tries to stop another entering the market, then this is anti-competitive. Spurs came so close to pulling off a deal, but then stood in the way of another. We will find out more with disclosure. Finally, from Keithy's uh, talking about the owners and directors test, which might have been applied differently for Man City. And here he says, my partner Gordon Steen is a professional. He knows his way around company's house. A little bit like Martin Dubravka knows his way around a six yard box. So I rang him a few days ago with a hunch and said, do me a favour, do this job yourself and go and spend the night looking into the Man City takeover. And he did. He worked early in, into the early hours. He went to check Man Manchester City in their takeover. We suspect no one has done this, not the buyer. The only comparison to this deal was Man City, and to our knowledge, the only time a state-owned company wanted to buy a Premier League football club. I respect what Man City have done. I don't begrudge them this because the fans had tough times, but it was okay for them to come in, but not the Saudis. So, we looked into their company changes. And these documents in the public domain appear to confirm, according to our legal sources, that the Abu Dhabi royal princes have never been asked to become directors. But the Saudi princes have because PIF want to buy Newcastle. What's worse is the deal appears to be stalled just because they won't agree to that. When the queen who does deals for the crown in this country or abroad, she doesn't get asked to be a director. They do a deal with the creditor of the company. And when the Duchy of Cornwall trades £1 billion worth of property, Prince Charles doesn't get asked to sit on the board. To ask royalty to sit on the board is an insult. And I cannot begin to explain how much of an insult that was to the Saudis. An insult from the Premier League. What we are challenging is why you are putting rules in place for Newcastle United that they were not in place for Manchester City. And at that stage, I think the owners and directors test crumbles. I don't even think they will go to court. So... It's, there's a couple of other bits on there. Pop on to Liam's uh, article on the shieldsgazette.com. It's well worth a read. Check out Liam on Twitter. Always well worth following Liam. Um, let's start with you, Mitch. What did you make of that? that that's explosive. And people have been asking for, for uh, Keith and the lads to come out and, and have a say and, and you know tell people what's going on. And thanks to the Premier League stupidity by putting this out into the public domain or someone else putting it out on the public domain by their behalf, um, whether that's deliberate or inadvertently, it's proved to be, you know, the straw that's brought the camel's back, but it's also opened the floodgates for, for Keith to come out and spill the beans. Yeah, Premier League aren't having the best of weeks, really, are they? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there was, there was already so much to discuss and so much that's come out this week. Um, and then Keith's interview sort of blows all of this wide open. Um, and the, the fascinating thing for me is if somebody was to want to pull an all night they're watching our shows back and back for the last few weeks, something was set, set up to go to, to, to get help get people through lockdown and things like that. And it certainly helped me get through lockdown over here at one point. Um, it, it marries with so much information that very credible people were making us aware of all, all along the lines. Um, and and there's so much in there, and there's so much intertwined, and yet it all boils down to one thing: a small group of clubs wanting to have all the money for themselves and a power grab. And it appears that the Premier League and the Football League and the FA have been implicit in their involvement in that, and. People seem to be terrified of allowing that deal to go through. And when the lads started this, one of the th things I was of the opinion of was any pressure is good pressure. Because some of these people have shown in the last two weeks that pressure is not their thing. Pressure is not something they can handle. And they make mistakes and they slip or they just don't perform well. And somebody from, from the Premier League in releasing that statement back the other, other way um, has absolutely and totally 
dropped the biggest clanger because they've, they've now, um, you know, just left everything wide open to be ha- to have a shot at. Um, I'm, I'm supposing uh, the, the lad's QC, when he got hold of that letter, was probably doing backflips, thinking, gosh, there's a lot to play, there's a lot to play with here. Um, and a lot more, it seems, than people probably would realise. Steve, good evening. What's your take on uh, on Liam's article and uh, interview with Keith? Explosive, all right. Um, surprised, not really. Some of it we were already aware of. Some of it we've talked openly about on here. Uh, I think of some of the things that that suddenly been disclosed there uh, that took me by surprise, um, if that's the word to use, was uh, the top one. Um, Liam goes on about joining dots, Steve. I, I, I've just joined some dots in my head uh, when you mentioned that the, the, the Spurs deal, and then Neil was putting there together the, the big picture um, program of, of the Premier League. And I remember it was a top six that they were talking about. Uh, you know, so who's in the top six? So we've got Liverpool, we've got Man United, we've got Man City, we've got Chelsea, we've got Tottenham, and we've got Tottenham's biggest rivals, Arsenal. There's your top six. You look at Project Big Picture, there's only five. Are, are Arsenal the, the whipping boys in this? Are Arsenal the ones who lose out of the top five? Um, is it surprised that you've got Tottenham, who are, I think, very, very influential in the Premier League under Daniel Levy, and certainly more influential than the Arsenal owner? Stan Kroenke, who sits in an ivory tower in, in America and doesn't even come over to watch his team, even though, granted, nobody's watching their teams now with COVID, but I don't think Stan Kroenke bothers at all. He's left it in the hands of his son. And I wonder how Arsenal fans feel if they suddenly realise that there's been backdoor deals obviously going on that could eliminate them from this project big picture and actually make them making out that they're part of a six when in fact, in effect, they're going to be tagged in with, what was it, West Ham? Um, was it Aston Villa? Um, was it Leicester? Was it Everton? There's four. They're going to be tagged in with, with at least three of those and potentially have no benefit, but more importantly, if you follow big picture, no say in what goes on in the Premier League and certainly no European Super League entry because that was going to be limited to five. So you start to join loads more dots than I think Liam Kennedy ever envisaged when he used the phrase a couple of weeks ago, Steve. It's like a bloody Dalmatian. Yeah, but... <laughs> it is, it is. Um, Ian, before I ask for your view on that, Doug's just asked a question, and we're getting that many questions in, and I don't want to lose it. Uh, can you ask Ian what the government can do concerning independent licence and a regulation of the Premier League? Well, well it's in that's been taking a, a, a turn um, over the last couple of days because with um, the, the, the sports minister announcing the rescue package for 11 sports, but which didn't include um, the upper echelons yes. of, of football, that, that in itself has, has raised some issues because um, Julian Knight, the chair of the DCMS Select Committee, of course, they, they interviewed uh, uh, Richard Masters, Rick Parry and Greg Clock just a fortnight ago, um, you know, he's he's actually said, well, look, the reason that this hasn't been done is because there hasn't been a deal done between the Premier League and the, and the English Football League um, over what happens to the championship. And, and of course, the championship is in um, real, real financial difficulties along with the rest of the English Football League because they haven't got the ready access to the uh, Premierships, Premier League's um, uh, television revenues. But of course, um, what Nate then went on to say today in a TV interview was that, um, you know, from my perspective, and this hasn't been the top of his agenda, this brings closer the spectre of an independent regulator and what he was then talking about. And, and, and this is not a very good analogy from his perspective because he was talking about the independent regulatory bodies for, for, the, for the financial world, which costs 250 million quid a year and is paid for by the financial 
markets and companies. But of course, an independent regulator for football wouldn't cost two hundred and fifty million pound a year. So it's it's not a it's not a good comparison. But he he, he was raising the spectre of an independent regulator for football. Now, of course, um, a fan-led review of football governance was actually in the Conservative Manifesto, and that's why a couple of weeks ago, on, on behalf of the all-party parliamentary group, I wrote to the Prime, Prime Minister to remind him of uh, you know, the, the, the fan-led review in their manifesto, particularly in the aftermath of Greg Clark's performance at the DCMS Select, Select Committee. So football's in a mess. It's quite clear the governance is uh, not fit for purpose, and it's quite clear that a lot of the people who've been leading football weren't fit for purpose uh, either. So, you know, all of that is is in amongst that. Um, uh, uh, but, I mean, th this, this latest stuff, frankly, uh, doesn't su surprise me. The only thing I would add about Stan Kroenke, though, is remember, he is, of course, American, as are Fenway Sports and the Glazers. So there's a connection there. And the media company that wanted to pay big bucks for a, a European proposed Super League is also American. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nathan Thomas has got a question there for you, uh, Ian. Uh, he says, an article in The Guardian claimed high-level intermediaries from government are involved and hopefully a deal can be revived. Have you heard anything on this, he says? Well, I, I'm afraid to say that um, I, I am not closely associated with high-level intermediaries of the Majesty's government. You know, bearing in mind I'm a member of the opposition party and they don't tend to tell us much. I understand, for instance, that um, a, a group of Northern Conservative MPs had a private meeting with the Prime Minister last week. And one of the topics which they raised um, for, for discussion was fan readmittance to football grounds, and which seemed to be a funny thing to be raising when we'd just gone back into lockdown. But having said that, you know, chance, ch chances are, uh, are there to be taken. But I, I would honestly hope that if the government were really seriously thinking about consulting on that, that they would actually have a consultation involving fans, groups like the Football Su Supporters Association and, you know, the all-party parliamentary group for football supporters, which in would involve me as well. I'd, I'd like to think so. Uh, that wouldn't be guaranteed, though, by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. and, 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 of course, you know, th there is, a, there is a, a possibility that government might be thinking of intervening in this mess, yeah, because of the mess of the governance that the, that, the, that the Premier League and the football authorities have got themselves in, and as was witnessed by the DCMS Select Committee uh, 10 days ago. And, and also, we've got the situation whereby the government really are keen on causing up to the Saudi Arabian government. I mean, an arms deal with the Saudi Arabian government is vital to this country, particularly with um, what could be a no-deal Brexit looming. Yep. Julie Baker is asking what your take is on Masters and Co's appearance before the committee and tellingly the chair's closing remarks regarding wanting to know all communications held between the EPL and the EFL. Well, I, th I think that's particularly to do with um, the compensation uh, package that the, 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 the Premier League are, are meant to be organising. And I think it, 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 is, it is notable, by the way, that football is being treated to all other sports industries and all other industries per se in terms of one part of the, 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 the industry having to organise its own compensation package for another part of the industry. That's not happening in any other sphere. That's not happening in any other sphere. And I know that the Premier League's got an awful lot of money by comparison to other sports, but the government are coming in and intervening. And, you know, they've just yesterday spent a package of, I think, £300 million to to rescue football, 11 yeah. different sports. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Interesting stuff. Keep your questions coming in. Ian's here till 7 o'clock. So if anyone has uh, got any more questions for Ian, then by all means, uh, put them across. Of course, we always get a question for you, uh, Mitch, and it's usually what you're drinking. And Neil's got in first asking, what you, <laughs> what, what are you drinking tonight? <laughs> Milan. It's well, from Milan. I, yeah, I found I found some little bottles of Mirica that I forgot I had. So... <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Tucked them tuck in the back of the wardrobe, so I've hugged them in the fridge earlier this afternoon. So, yeah, it's Moretti tonight. I, I, I got a real taste for that in Milan. Like, <laughs> I mean, it went until they ran out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you 
we don't mind Mitch and Steve, but obviously questions are coming in for Ian and we only have them for an hour. So he's, uh, are the DCMS aware or could you make them aware that Bird and Bird represent both the EFL and the EPL, which must be a conflict concern, says Toon oh, Cryer, Ian. It's one, of, it's, it's one of those glass ceiling things, you know, you get them all the time where, you know, the, the, the big accounting companies are acting as accountants and, and also as auditors and they're saying, oh, well, it's a different arm of our, a different division. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah it's interesting it's interesting with with obviously with social media mitch things are you know they have become heated you know i've had my much yeah. publicized spats with a couple of journalists and chose to block them and just move on and uh, we've had fallouts between you know different different accounts etc and it's been a big thing over the over the the lockdown period in particular but um it's been interesting to watch a certain journalist delete his tweets this week uh, after he dropped a major faux pas, which has led to all of this. Yeah, well, I've got to pick, pick my words carefully. Um, it's, it's somebody that I sort of uh, kind of know because mm. um, you, you spent a lot of time here in Dubai and I know a lot of the lads that work in sports media here in Dubai. Um, I've, I've said about them all along... Um, do your research and make your own mind up about Ben. Um, there are there are things which are not hard to find about them that are fact, and, and let's stick with facts. Um, and uh, my problem with him was never that he worked for being at some stage because he did, um, and it doesn't necessarily make him a Qatari shill uh, or bias him in any way in that respect. Um, my problem with him's always been about credibility. Um, somebody who has a lifetime ban from the BBC um, and more recently another fact he did a podcast for the Chronicle um, that was embellished and had things in it that were totally made up to the point where the Chronicle had to pull and delete the podcast from that website and, and I know that still rankles with the, one of the lads that was involved with it very much to this day because he took a shellacking on social media after that, a real hammer. Um, very unfairly to be to be fair, because I mean when I did some of the radio shows when 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 we took over Toon Talk uh, from your good self, uh, Steve. When, yeah. when I did uh, when I did Capital Radio's Friday Sports Show for a little while out here, um, we used to get Ben on the show and speak to Ben. And he, he's a great raconteur and a fabulous orator and he speaks very well, speaks very credibly. But let's just say there's other things I'm aware of um, from his time over here that would match some of the things that we've just mentioned before. Yeah. Um, and, and and that's always been my problem with, with Ben. It was, it was not about the fact he worked for B in for a stint. Um, it, you know, people had a go at him recently saying, oh, he's, he's worked for, working for B in. He's not worked for B in for ages. And nor has he free, freelanced for them for ages. That's That's pretty clear. Yeah. Um, and he does have sources and he does have people he get information out of. He's currently working with the Soccer X presentations, you know, so th that's somebody who has got connections. Um, but what he does with the information he gets um, and then embellishes around the edges, for me, I find the things he says and, and, and writes interesting. Um but you approach it with caution. And that's that's just always been my opinion about it. Nothing to do with the B in angle. Yeah. The fact that the fact that Steve actually called him out the other day um, and sat him on his arse very brilliantly, I thought, Steve. Um, and then in the next 30 to 40 minutes, he started deleting things. Um, I've been told something else from another very credible source that the, the, the series of tweets that he put out very much read like somebody who'd been briefed on what to say. And I think that's the most damning thing of all. And yeah. probably the reason why he's gone on a bit of a delete fest. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's interesting, Steve. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's been, a, as I say, it's been a year of... Uh... This kind of thing going on, and you know, people putting their head, you know, their head on the chopping block, if you like, with opinions and stuff. But um, I think this is the biggest, biggest thing we've seen yet on social media, and it's been seized upon by uh, by Keith and the boys. Yeah, definitely, Stephen. I've got to say that in in all the time we've been doing this show, everything that we've said, 
we, we haven't embellished, we haven't made up, we haven't created and concocted during the week with the three of us sitting down on WhatsApp to think of something that could be a sensationalised story. What we've done is we've, we've reported on the facts as they've been presented to us. And we've also checked out the sources of those facts and we've been doubly sure before we've even spouted them. We've, we may have implied certain things. We may have tried to lead people in a certain direction because we knew that we couldn't actually disclose our sources as, as seems to be the, uh, the probably the most common phrase that I've heard flying around this week from a number of journalists. Um, oh no, journalists don't disclose their, disclose their sources, etc. Well, we've never we've never done that. But what we've done is we've made sure that whatever we've said, we've been able to say um, because the people who have told us have been able to verify what we what what the information that we've had to hand. And I know that I, I put something on Twitter early on today about um, the fact that. Yeah, we, we, we haven't tried to flam anybody. We've just reported as it is. You've taken an awful lot of flack. Um, on the other shows, people have taken flack. And I'm not bothered about that because I knew, and Mitch is probably exactly the same as me, he, he knew that what we were saying, we we were, to coin a phrase, we were cocksure about the information that we had. And that's why the three of us have been so 100% behind everything that we've said and, and about the fact that we've always, even before June, after June, after all of the flack that we've taken, the number of people who said that the deal's dead, the deal's dead. And yesterday proved that the deal isn't dead. Yesterday proved that the Saudis are still lingering there, waiting. They've got a different strategy, but they're still there. Mike Ashley is taking a different strategy that nobody knew about, in inverted commas, until yesterday when the Premier League decided to tell everybody he was taking them to court for whatever reason. And the very fact that Keith's come out and disclosed that stuff today is has vindicated, in a way, what we've known. Not 100% of what we've known and not 100% of what Keith's told us because Keith's thrown some... Some absolutely brilliant things in today that were a, a surprise to us all. But when you know what, it's, it's just the whole football thing, guys. The whole the whole situation with the Premier League. I call them cuckoo and cuckoo. I'm not going to refer to them as their proper names because that's what they are. Because they're an organisation that's sitting in so many nests and 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 coming and and trying to cover their back. They'll no doubt be covering the back. But they are, they're cuckoos. These lawyers, that the Premier, with the Premier League, with the EFL, we know that they represent EFL clubs. We know that they're representing the EFL in conversations with the Premier League on Project Big Picture, compensation-wise. And we know that they're actually supporting the Premier League in what the EFL are wanting. So it's like, it's like they're sitting there in the scales of justice. Now, Ian's dead right. That might that that's the glass ceiling. That might not be any any sort of um, any problem to the legal profession, but it doesn't make the legal profession look very good. No, and it, and it makes you and I question what the legal profession is all about. And if they had any form of credibility, they'd walk away from one side and they'd start again, and they'd have credible people. In the room, and more than likely, that's what's knocked the, the DCMS this week. Mm. Because there's a there's a log jam, there's a hold up, and it's been going on nearly a month. While clubs that Mitch and I have talked about are falling off the edge of a cliff. Mm. Yeah, and, and and small clubs and potentially big clubs falling off the edge of that cliff, and they're just sitting and they're allowing it to happen. And for me, that's the sad part of football at the moment. Forget about our court case. Forget about Mike Ashley's court case. Forget about Piff sitting there in the desert waiting for it all to be resolved. What about what about what's going on? And what about what the EFL and the Premier League, and just as importantly, the head of the EFL, Rick Parry, is allowing mm, yeah. on his watch? What uh, is that all about? Why oh. is he doing that? What is his motives? You have a motive and you have an opportunity. He's got an opportunity to sort it, but he has a motive behind him, not do I question. 
Well, well Steve, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't know this definitively, but there is speculation. So I'll put, I'll couch it in those terms. There is speculation that the way in which Rick Parry was trying to sell Operation Big Picture as the rescue package to the AFL clubs seemed to implicate that he had some sort of axe to grind with the big six themselves and also with the subsequent announcement about another move towards a European Super League. Now, that's all speculation. Yep. You know, I don't know what the veracity of it is, but it's worth checking out. Well, on my side, I would, I would question that, Ian, and I would say that there's, on, a, on an equal level, there's the possibility that Rick Parry was actually sitting in both camps because yes. he's arguing on one side for the yeah. EFL, but we know that he is so he was the head of the Premier League for a long time. We know he has links with Liverpool, and we know that he more than likely, because he's been pushing it, has aspirations yeah. to run the European Super League. But but the thing is, Steve, you see, why why would Rick Parry, in his position working for the English Football League, try to sell Operation Big Picture to the English Football League when it was actually classified by people within the English Football League as a sugar-coated cyanide pill. Yeah. In other words, what it looked like was a really good initial sweetener, but then in terms of the, the long-term financial rewards to the English Football League from the Premiership, premiership cast, cascading down was going to be a very, very poor Settlement indeed. Yeah, and I would question because what the benefit he, would be for the Premier League, and what the benefit would be long term for Rick Parry. No, I'm look, sorry, Mitch, before you come in, I'm, I'm, I'm posing that as a rhetorical question. Oh, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you know. Yeah. Rick, Rick Parry knows how many of those clubs in League One and League Two are desperate for cash, and yeah. will take any cash right now. So mm. many of those clubs are so irresponsibly financially run and are sitting on and, and were, prior to COVID, dangling their feet over the edge of the Grand Canyon, chucking stones down to see how long it took to hit the bottom because that's how they were being run. Mm-hmm. COVID and the resulting financial pressure has got them now hanging by a couple of fingernails where their backside's itching. And some of them are going to go. There's no doubt about that. For me, Sunderland's takeover machinations at the minute is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic to keep the land revenue away for a little bit longer, for example. And there'll be more strange moves like that coming in League One and League Two. And Parry knew he could make himself out to be a hero in the short term with the Football League because so many of them are desperate for cash. And then in the long term, put himself into a position where he could put himself first and take a job with a Super League. It bloody wouldn't surprise me if he didn't write the bloody Newcastle and say when this takeover's done, can I be a can I be a chief executive or something like that? It just wouldn't surprise us because nothing with that man would surprise us because I don't think there's any bottom to the depths that he'd go to to serve himself in this entire way he's gone on with the football league. He effectively was trying to sell the football league down the river. Your, 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 your phrase, sugar-coated cyanide pill, you couldn't put it better because that's yeah. what he was selling them, wrapped um, in a well, big box of snake oil. Well, well Mitch, I mean, so, some of the stats about what's actually happening financially in the English Football League, there are 11 clubs in divisions uh, one and two who haven't got enough revenue to pay their salaries at the end of this month. Yeah. And in terms of the championship, the championship clubs collectively are paying the players alone 108% of their annual turnover. Oh, Christ. You know, Crazy, isn't it? Which, which business can get away with that for any period of time? You know, I, I remember, you know, um, sitting, I think Steve will remember sitting talking to. Um, Lambias when he was trotting off, you know, some of the clubs that were running at uh, 65 to 70 percent wages versus turnover, and telling telling me and Steve that they were really well run clubs, and we're sort of looking across the table at each other, it's in our eyebrows. Um, it's it's just a mess. There's no other industry can be so irresponsibly run. Yeah. And, and when off, these then. clubs start to go, the communities are gonna hurt so mm-hmm. bad. 
if you ran a pub with a turnover of 30% wages to turnover, you would be closed down. You wouldn't would. be able to exist. You should be you should be in in that situation. You'd be hovering around the 23, 25, 27 mark, and yet we've got like Ian just said, clubs with a hundred and six percent turnover and beyond. <laughs> it's probably beyond. It's just, it's that's, just that's just for players' wages. That's yeah. just players' wages. Yeah, I, or just yeah. players' wages. Yeah. yeah I, so so uh, in, you know, paying the VAT bill, paying the inland revenue, paying other staff, paying maintenance of that stadium. You know. Not not included. One hundred and six percent on players' wages alone. Men, yep. Uh, just want to say a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, newworkwear.com, specialists in the supply and branding of clothing for the workplace. They're sponsoring the StreamYard application this month. And a big shout out to qtechshop.co.uk, the makers of pool tables and snooker tables in Walls End and other things, including our T-shirts, uh, which you can get from newcastlelegends.com. Uh, and you can also get our calendars, which are on sale. All proceeds going to the food bank and... Uh, they also knock up the T-shirts like that one. NUFC Matters Join the Dots T-shirt, which is up for grabs on my social media, at Steve Wraith. Um, all proceeds go into the food bank. It's currently at £75, and the bidding on that finishes on Monday. So anybody wants to do that, it's pinned at the top of my Twitter, at Steve Wraith, and uh, you will be able to find it there. Quick happy birthdays to Grant Hanley, who celebrates today, and uh, Paul Robinson, who... Oh, uh, nice is probably best known for coming on uh, and playing instead of Alan Shearer and Duncan Ferguson yes. in the derby, which were lost 2-1 in the rain, uh, which ultimately saw Rude Hullett lose his job. So big happy birthday to them. Paul still lives in the area, still a good lad, and always chips in and plays in the uh, the Pavel Cup at Dunstan uh, when we uh, get a chance to play that. And later, uh, I have been talking about this all week, we are the Geordies. Football without fans is nothing, said Jock Steen. This film kicks off on the 11th of December. I'm pleased to say we had uh, a small part to play in helping Zara and James achieve their dream. Um, I've seen one of the uh, the rough cuts of this, and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, December the 11th cannot come quick enough for me, but we'll be dropping our own personal trailer on the show tonight. You might have seen it on the Chronicle already. We've got a, a slightly different one to show people. So uh, we will be playing that a little bit later on. Um, a lot of people talking about uh, Ian Holloway's uh, interview, uh, Ian. And he was he was really having a pop today. And I, I've got to be honest, I like Ian Holloway. I wouldn't want him to manage our, our football club, Ian. But yes. his, his interview today was very, you know, was straight from the heart. And he's that kind of guy, isn't he? He's, um, you know, he gets his message across in, in, in whatever way he thinks is, you know, which which will get as much publicity as possible. But it was, it was interesting to hear him today. And he's, he's obviously very annoyed. He had his hat off at one point. And he was he's saying, I might as well do this and go begging for money because we're not getting anything. No. Well, unfortunately, I haven't seen the interview because I've been looking at the screen all day doing all that stuff. But, um, you know, it, it, I mean, I, I did see him interviewed a couple of weeks ago and, you know, he didn't pull any punches. He was he was really calling people uh, out for, for the lack of support that clubs at, at their level were getting, uh, you know, from, from, from above. But that position hasn't got any better. And, you know, as I say t today, the chair of the DCMS Select Committee, which is not the DCMS department, but it's just the Select Committee, which oversees the department and um, you know I was having a proper go and but you see the thing is I'm not really sure whether the DCMS itself are going to be high enough in government to, to implement a, a, a fan-led review that is a manifesto commitment from the government and that's why I wrote the prime minister about it it's his it's in his department it's actually in number 10 this that decision will have to be made I believe B. Taylor says, can you honestly see the government in the guise of the DCMS taking the EPL to the cleaners, Ian? Well, no, I, I, I don't. I, I don't. But, I, but as I say, if they do f fulfil their manifesto promise, which I'm told they're very keen to do, you know, the leader of the House said that to me last Thursday. Um, you know, they, they, if it's a manifesto promise, they will fulfil it, is what he said. Well, it, therefore... If they properly instigate that and properly instigate a fan-led review, well, we'll have, we've got to get get stuck in, roll our sleeves up, and do it properly. Yeah, yeah. Ian Holloway's interview. Did you see it today, Mitch? I've seen bits of it. Yeah. Uh, little little clips chucked around on Twitter. Um, look, like you, I'm I'm exactly the same opinion. I love to hear Ian Holloway speak. I think he's a very honest, straightforward. I think he cares about football. I think he sees. Um, 
to 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 I guess to 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 use a, a phrase not in quotes. He sees a bigger picture when it comes to the whole football world, um, and he's always you know forthright with his opinions. I love these love these Ronaldo rant, for example. That pretty great. I wouldn't like to see him managing our club. I don't 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 think he's right for here. Uh, yeah. But you need people like that in football who are prepared to stand up and say, "Hey, no, that's not right." Um, and and and, I, and he, he he gets it. He gets the passion. Um, I know they still think a lot of him down to cute we are for everything he did there, mm-hmm. and and quite rightly so. Um, so yeah, it, it it's the kind of thing you would expect Ian Holloway to say, and he's he's proven that he's quite consistent in the way he fe- feels about the game. I, I think there's a lot of people like that in the game still, but we need them now to start to speak up. And what I would hope that does is encourage more people who feel the same way to actually come out and say, yeah, come on, this isn't right, lads. The, 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 the game itself is now in a place where um, certain things are happening that are just absolutely immoral. Um, and, and and that's talking about the game that's had doubts about its morality since the late 90s. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, it's it's... We're now seeing a lot of people's true colours and that's quite worrying because a lot of these people have got the positions whereby they've been able to entrench themselves within the fabric of the structure of the game um, and it's quite obvious there's a lot of self-serving benefit happening. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you the name that doesn't doesn't get bandied around at the moment too much and maybe should be is Hoffman as well. What's happened with him since he came in um, at, at the start of June? Because he at the minute seems to be getting a free ride. Mm-hmm. And he's another one who needs pressed and he needs pressured. Now, whether that's going to come about by things like the lads taking the action or whether that's going to come about by the club taking action. But again, it comes back to any pressure is good pressure because these guys have proved now for the last two weeks, pressure is not that thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, Steve, your views on Ian Holloway. He's, uh, he's certainly come out and you know put his put his opinion across in his, in his own imitable fashion. But uh, I think a lot of people agree with what he had to say. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the good thing about Ian Holloway, is, as Mitch said, is he yeah he puts his heart on his sleeve, doesn't he? He comes out and he says what he thinks. He's a, he's the sort of guy who you know I think he's I think he's straightforward and honest. Um, he's he's, he's that sort of manager who's. In the past, has said, you know, I'm not really good enough for this job, so I'll move on. Um, you know, mm-hmm. and he, he, he doesn't. He, he's not that. That's that's a level of honesty that you don't get in football. Um, or certainly don't get it very often. Um, and I think that there's an awful lot of people in football could learn from uh, listening to, to to his experience and and his knowledge and and his forthrightness. Um, the, uh, the, there's various people like that in the game, though, Steve. There's various people that, that say things that you, that you kind of go, you know, even though I don't support your football club, but as, and as Mitch says, we wouldn't necessarily think you are the best sort of person mm-hmm. for, for running our football club um, as a manager, for example. But I respect your opinion. And I respect your thoughts. Um, and, and you do that because you know that those thoughts have been well thought out. They're structured mm. and that 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 open and they've they're considered. They're not just off the cuff. And going back to, to something we said earlier about a reporter, a certain reporter, um, they're not from somebody else's briefing either. Yes. And yeah, and that yeah. that that for me is vitally important. Um, so he's come out. He said what he's he said, and of course he spent a lot of time in. In the lower leagues, as a manager and as a player, um, and he probably has really serious concerns about that level of the game, where he's earned a decent living from. But he wants to he wants to make sure that if he can't put something back, that other people are making sure that the game still exists in eighteen months, two years' time, at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes of, of Ian left, so I do want to turn uh, to uh, at least one football matter, so Ian can talk a little bit about football. Um, we've already. Put, uh, <laughs> hey, so, I'll meet... Steve, 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 count me out. I'm a Newcastle supporter, man. <laughs> <laughs> just just, just what, what I talk about, Almiron, and uh, Steve Bruce, of course, had his press conference today and completely belittled 
Almiron's agent for uh, what he said was, you know, he essentially was whipping things up in the uh, the, the, the press about a potential move. Um, I suppose the first question is, um, what did you make of Bruce's reaction to Dan? I know you've been busy, but I mean, essentially, he just, you know, he slated the agent and, um, you know, said that, you know, if it had been Almiron coming and knocking on his door and having an issue, then he would look at it differently. Um and I suppose, secondly, is 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 Almiron worth all this all this fuss, really? Because there seems to be a certainly a swing in supporters' views. I mean, you know, a lot of people weren't convinced about him. You know, he, he runs around with a smile on his face, but he isn't he isn't somebody who tends to do that well in front of goal. He had one little burst, but I don't know. The the jury seems to be out on Almiron, and there's not an uproar of people saying we've got to keep him. You know. No, well, I, I mean, I, th- I think first and foremost, I, I think Steve Bruce's reaction probably um, it, it, it smacks of a, a bit of lack of sort of professionalism in terms of managing his own playing staff. Um, you know, I, I mean, agents are agents, but I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, you've just got to kind of just regard that as fluff and just put it to one side, you know, because remember, he's still got to manage that player and he's he's going to he's going to be part of our squad at least at least until the the January um, transfer window at, at the very at, at the very uh, shortest uh, time and 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 you know from from his international per- performances Almiron seems to get picked picked for his national side and play quite well for them um, so is he being played out of position or is he being played in a formation at Newcastle that doesn't suit him I, I must admit if I was Almiron. Um, uh, and I, I'd been played in the sort of way that I had by our current manager. I, I wouldn't kind of enam- enamour to me towards, um, you know, my retention uh, as, as a Newcastle player. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I really do think Bruce is more of a problem than Almiron, like. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I would agree uh, Mitch, Almiron, it's been an interesting week uh, We seem to have been waiting for Bruce's press conference To, to put this one to bed And uh, yeah, a lot of people asking Do you even think Almiron wants to be here? I mean, I, I would find it very hard to believe That the agent has come out and said all of this Without at least speaking to Miggy You'd think so, but you never know how some agents work um, They've just seen ASM get a nice Big long contract extension uh, you would have thought there's thoughts in their head. Well, hang on, if he can get that, then can I have one as well, please? Um, you know my feeling about football agents and about how much money they drain out of the game, mm-hmm. and uh, and I don't like that. Don't like that at all. Um, Steve and I could tell everybody about the the dealings with Czech to you as agents after Czech last year. And there were still things going on with them that we were trying to sort of. Work out with and, and make sure the family got money they were owed and due, and agents were lining up to take left, right, and centre where possible, even in a tragic situation like that. So I've got no time for agents myself. Um, in some respects, I've got a lot of respect for Bruce for having a pop with the agent. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I say about Bruce is he's not frightened to uh, fight back a little openly. Um, whether Brusk is the man who can get the best out of Almiron, that's a different matter. Um, I like Almiron simply because he, he, he looks like he gives a shit, which is at, at least is more than you can say about some individuals. Um, but equally, if, if you want to, like so many people, if you want to go off just stats and stats alone, they're not great on his part. And we need a little bit more out of him in terms of creativity and and, and, and goals and whatever other XG you want to put on things. Um, is he being used in the best role for him at the moment? I don't know. Because to be frank, <clears throat> he probably doesn't know one week to the next what kind of position or role he's going to be put into because there seems to be no plan on Bruce's part and make it up as you go along. And Well, that worked last week, so let's do the same again and find out that the team against you have done something different and work it out. So it, it, it's... It's not good to seem to not have a united camp. And it's not good as a club to feel that somebody may want to be away. And whether that's due to an agent being in his ear or whether that's something that's come from the player himself, I would say if it's come from the player himself a little bit to the agent, can you blame him? I don't want players who are happy to be sitting on the bench. Mm-hmm. I want players who are unhappy to be on the bench. 
I want. That's why I never have a problem with Richie kicking off and punching anything he can get his hands on if he's <laughs> subbed, because frankly, that's what you want players to feel like. Mm -hmm. You want them to care. You want them to not be happy just to take their wages and sit on the bench. God, Lord knows we've had enough of them in our club in the last 10 years. Plus, who will take a fat wage packet and bugger off um, and not really care and just sit there and take it and even smirk on the bench when we're conceiving goals. You know, you don't want any of that in the squad. So it, it, it it, you know, squad relationships and relationships within football are complicated enough as it is. So there's, I can understand, to be fair to Bruce here, why he's kicked off about because I probably bloody would as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Steve. It's uh, as I say, it has been ongoing all week. But Bruce, I suppose, is uh, you know he has put it to bed really today, and um, you know we'll watch with interest. I suppose when the next transfer window comes round. Yeah, he's had his say. You know that, that I'll, I'll give him that. Um, interesting what Mitch was saying about about are we playing him right? You watch him playing for Atlant Atlanta, and was it Atlanta that he played for in the in the US? In the, it was yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. yeah, and you watch him where he was picking the ball up and what he was doing with it, and you saw him taking free kicks. You saw him picking the ball up in the in the last third. You saw him linking up with with strikers. You saw a connection there with a with a a, a teammate that just seemed to be telepathic. Um, you then see him play for Paraguay and you see him pick up the ball on the inside left or the inside right position to, to, to use an old fashioned adage. But for those younger people listening, what I mean is in the in the top part of the opposition's play um, pitch and, and running with the ball and, and breaking into the box. Um, and then you see him playing for Newcastle and he's picking up the ball on the edge of our box and he's then running. And then he's being brought down on the halfway line, or he's barely getting across right. the halfway line, or he's so quick that the strikers haven't even caught up with him. And so I'd question whether we are using that particular player in the right way. There's also the aspect that when he plays with San Maximan, everything seems to suddenly have to go through him. Because we've 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 developed a tactic that allows San Maximan to pick the ball up if it's in the centre of the pitch. And run with it in the hope that we're going to get he's going to get brought down and we can get a free kick and we can go for a set piece. And then when we do get the set piece, it's not Almiron. I've never seen Almiron take a free kick yet. You know, not a goal scoring opportunity free kick, and yet we see him taking those goal scoring opportunity free kicks for for previous clubs. So are we using them correctly? Oh, that's that's a question for the coach, really. Not a question for us. I have an opinion on it. But it's a question for the coach. Is he using that particular player in the right way? More than likely, turn around and go, well, the player doesn't fit into his into his formation or he doesn't fit into the style of player that he wants to play because we do play very, very defensive. We do play um, in, a, in, a, in a situation that allows us to try and not concede goals rather than attack. Um, lately, we have tried to see if we can start breaking a little bit quicker, but... Again, even that tends to fall flat when we're only playing with a one striker up front on his own. And if those, if those three or four central midfield players um, or midfielders, including the two central, are playing so deep, then it kind of wipes out that 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 tactic that you have, and it also negates the ability uh, that you've got on the pitch. You know, it doesn't it doesn't exploit. Um, and it doesn't allow you to exploit the, the the opposition by you attacking them in that particular way. We, we don't we don't run with the ball in that manner. We tend to kick the ball away. Uh, and so, is Bruce using them the right way? I don't think he is. To be perfectly honest. Yeah, we've got breaking news just before uh, Ian goes off. Chi and Wura uh, tweeted something today. Uh, the government's finally responded to the petition that she presented for greater transparency in the Premier League following the collapse of the takeover. Uh, she says on her tweet, but warning, it is deeply, deeply disappointing. Can't understand how it took them two months to write it. Um, so if you wanted to have a, a look on that, check out Chi on Twitter, Chi on Wura. Um, it is deeply, deeply disappointing. Um, can, we ask Ian, can we ask you, Ian, do you think they've just dug it out of Dominic Cummings' draw? Do you think it's been lying there for weeks? And finally, when they've cleared him out and they've desanitised de yeah. the room that he was sitting in, do you think they suddenly found this letter that was supposed to go to Chi? 
No, no, I, I understand. It was actually found in a litter bin in Barnard Castle. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I think, I think on that note, Ian, we'll, we'll call it a day. You've always got to leave on a high, mate. I'm, I'm sure you. I'm sure. I'm sure you got a lot to do, and uh, just, it's always, always good to have just, you on. You know. Just before I go, Steve. I, I mean, I know there's been a lot of people on on the chat criticising agents, you know, and 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 I, and I think this is true the world over of sports agents generally. And I was just wondering if you'd heard the story about the cruise ship where there was a convention of sports agents which sank in the South Pacific and everybody on board was eaten by sharks but the sports agents. And apparently the reason for that was <laughs> professional <laughs> etiquette. <laughs> well, you haven't just finished on one good line, you've finished on two. <laughs> You're on a roll. You're on a roll, Ian. As always, absolute pleasure to have you on. And I know because uh, you, you know people love it when you come on. We'll have to do one again together. So we'll sort that out. And I know you're going to jump on the uh, the documentary that I'm doing. Think before you tweet as well to talk about uh, a couple of things on there. So a uh, big thank you for that. And uh, I'll be in touch very soon, mate. But thanks for coming on. Look forward to having you on again. Well, have a good weekend, lads, and stay safe, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers, Ian. Take care, mate. Always great to have Ian Mearns on. Absolute, uh, absolutely great. And, um, you know, thanks for your questions to him as well. He's uh, a politician that answers questions, which is the reason that we uh, will have him on. Um, anybody wants to uh, join the channel? I know we've got over nearly over 800 people watching at this current moment. If you haven't, if you've just stumbled across this or joined us for the first time, you can click subscribe. That's a big, big help to us. Gets our numbers up for the channel. Uh, currently with the biggest watched uh, Newcastle United fans channel uh, on the go and uh, we really do appreciate that so click subscribe it's free that's all you need to do if you want to join the channel as a member um, and make a small donation you can do that helps us it helps us do StreamYard. it helps us with various other things so if you want to do that please do just click join or you can hit the little dollar sign in the chat and make a donation thanks for that if you do um, and if you just want to help us as well get the, get the word out if you click share um, you can actually share that to Twitter or your Facebook or your LinkedIn. Uh, that does us a big favour as well because we're getting new uh, new visitors to the, the page each day. Lots of people stumbling on the shows. And as I say, we do do at this moment in time, we do seven days a week, different content each night. And uh, we enjoy doing it. So uh, for the next uh, or for the foreseeable future, until there's a vaccine, we'll certainly be continuing to do seven in a night. So a little bit earlier, I did mention um, that we are the Geordies film. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll talk about this for uh, the next 15, 20 minutes or so. And I'm um, going to come to you first, Steve, uh, about it before we show the trailer. Um, you're probably best placed to tell us, you know, what the idea was behind this, who's behind it and, um, you know, how long it's taken to get to this stage. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the film was the the the, the creation and the and the... The thought of Zora Zamorodian and uh, husband James DeMarco, who you know they, they, that's their that's their profession. They're, 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 that's what they do for a living. They make they make films. And if anybody's ever seen the film The Stag Do, um, that they produced a few years back, you know, an absolutely classic um, Jody film, uh, which I thought was probably on a par with Purely Belter, if I'm perfectly honest. Which you know a lot of people um, thoroughly enjoyed back in the day. And Zora came to me and said, you know what, I, I fancy making a film. I fancy making a film about Newcastle United, but not, not a documentary about how the, you know, the, the club operates or anything like that. I'd like to do it from the viewpoint of the fans. I'd like to do it from something different. Uh, I don't want to concentrate on the players. I don't want to concentrate on X, Y and Z. I don't want to concentrate on the manager too much. I want to do like a love story. I want to show what Newcastle, support Newcastle's about. What do you reckon? And I said to her, I think it's a great idea. It's a great idea. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how you're going to manage it, but I think it's I think it's fant a fantastic idea, an embryo that you've got. And let's see, let's see where it can take it. I, I, I spoke to both you guys about it, uh, and you guys have been in from the start as well, uh, to be perfectly honest with everybody. And, I mean, Mitch is actually in the film, believe it or not. Um, his ugly mug appears um, at certain intervals, as does our great friend George, uh, George Mitchell. Um, and George was one of the 11 fans that basically what Zara did was decide to, to follow a group of fans through a season. Now, the season, the season that, we, that 
we chose, or Zarek chose and James, um, happened to be the season we got relegated and we were playing in the championship. So basically, it follows the story of 11 fans and their thought process and what was going through their minds during that particular season. You know, we'd been relegated and we had our first game of, in the championship against Fulham and then it works through and it follows those fans on that journey um, through until the final game um, where we where we ended up getting promoted. Not only getting promoted, but winning the championship. Um, a love story to the fans is what Zara called it, uh, to be perfectly honest. Now, if I'm... You know, I have to I have to point out to you that this one of the things we persuaded Zara to do was to, to get all the fan groups together. Mm. So Zara went out you know, at our behest and she spoke to NUST, she spoke to True Faith, the fan dean, uh, she spoke to uh, NUFC Fans United, which we're all part of, um, you know, as a fan group. Um, she spoke to the lads of Chide Seats, you know, uh, Robbo and, uh, and and Matty uh, and Gaz. Um, just we were producing the popular side fanzine at the time that was out there. She, she you know, she had our backing. Taylor and Bestie, who had their own little podcast at the time, she, you know, she 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 gathered as much opinion as she could. She did as much research as she could with the fan groups that were around at that particular time. Um, or the influencers, if that's what you want to see, or the podcasters, or the or the fanzines and the and the, the content. But she also went to George Colkin. She went to and she she got opinion from him. She got opinion from Supermark, uh, from Gibbo. And um, there was your fanzine, Steve, that were doing the Players Inc. stuff that we were doing at the particular time. The Nine Bar stuff that had been going on. So it was very much a collaboration, if you like, um, in terms of of. Get it, Zara getting the opportunity to understand what the psyche was, and that helped her to pick the eleven fans that she wanted to that she wanted to follow. Um, and I mean, at this point, I, I'd say that if, if ever there's a lesson to be learned um, as we go forward as fans um, into the next sort of couple of months, and, and what we've seen with the Newcastle uh, supporters consortium, is that when you get together, you can do some great things. You can do some absolutely brilliant things. And I think when people see this film on the 11th of December, when it comes out on DVD, um, they'll be amazed at, at the passion that comes yeah. across about, and, and I think everybody will be able to take yeah. it in. Everyone will be able to, to, to sit there and everyone will have their hairs on the back of their neck standing up and everybody will be in tears at the end. Um, tears of passion, tears of joy. <laughs> Tears of the fact that they can remember the same tears that they had when we won something and, and we lived through it. Um, and yes, there's, come, there's some fan groups around now that you probably didn't speak to because they weren't around then. Some of the youngsters that weren't about then, some of the, some of the people are doing some great YouTube content, um, but they weren't there, so there's nobody to ask. But maybe they can learn from that and they can, and, and they can see that some of the older generation have an awful lot to say as well as... The, the younger generation were part of this film, you know. So anyway, the, the, it's taken her four years to bring it together. Obviously, she's she's financed it herself. Um, she's 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 done a hell of a lot of work. The, the post production took a bit of time, but not as much as yeah. traveling around. She went. She, there was there was making the guys at the back page who supported them when they travelled on the buses. There were people from SH Travel that support on the buses. There's plenty of fans out there that will have known what she was up to, but probably think it had died a death. But they're going to be pleasantly surprised about what they see. We had great support from the football club. We got access to Rafa. We got access to players. We got access to, to, to photographs that the club were able to provide us with. We've got there's a little bit of footage in there, but the footage and the, the actual season itself is not, you know, the, the games that were played. That's not the real story. The real story is the story of the fans and how we reacted during that season and what emotions we're going through. And I think that's what's going to make it a unique because people are going to expect, oh, it's a documentary and there's just going to be, you know, uh, Roger Thames's commentary over the top of something, you know, as, as we've seen in documentaries yeah. of the past or a club video, an end of season video. It's nothing like that. It will surprise. I hope it will surprise. 
I expected the surprise. And I hope that everybody sees, especially in this day and age, what we've been going through with not being able to get in the ground, that it gets your excitement back for being inside St. James's yeah. Park again, 52,000. And what it was like, this will remind you what it was like, and this will tell you why you want to get back in there, Steve. It's, I, it's, yeah. I, I, I personally feel this is Mitch. Before you say anything, I just want to say I personally think Mitch, we will all cry at this, but I I yes. also think the the emotion of this will be completely enhanced because we can't go to the game, and it's gonna yeah. be it's gonna be very very emotional because we'll all be thinking, God, I missed that, you know, won't yeah. we? Yeah. Well, should you suddenly when you see it from the the the, the rough cut bits I've seen. And been fortunate enough to have shared by Zara. Um, is it will it'll, it'll it'll it's a real heartstring puller because that's what's missing. And be, she gave me permission to share bits and bobs out in this region as well. Um, and a couple of the guys that have seen it have both have said how wonderful this will be to dispel that lazy myth about what Newcastle fans are. And yeah. want, and and you know, um, I'll be speaking to somebody through the week about um, trying to get it get the distribution here in the Middle East, and and the spin he put on it was, what we want to package this as, is this is our gift, as Newcastle fans, to the new friends we've made in the region, to mm-hmm. say, if you because bear in mind we've had two. Two years of interest from this region in both the UAE and in Saudi Arabia. And we've made friends already. This will more than make friends. This, this is almost like Geordie ambassadorial stuff for the region. Because it will take that lazy, horrible myth that we spend far too long trying to dispel. Because it's easy to say, oh, they just expect too much. Really? Watch the film and see the truth about what we expect as fans, you know. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to get my ugly mug in in one trip back home. Uh, when I was back, proud of my dad for giving his thoughts throughout all of it, as ever, in the way he does. Um, lucky enough to be in some small way involved with backing up a project of a really good friend who's literally put blood, sweat and tears into it. Uh, and the highs and the lows that she's been through along the way to get this bloody thing out. Um, and delighted that Steve's been able to push her that, that final mile to get it over the line to kind of free us. Um, and I think everybody will enjoy it. Um, and it will bring all those emotions to the surface, particularly while we're looking at the St. James's part that is genuinely empty. Yeah. yeah. One of the um, things what who's, is well who's broadcasting it, Steve? Just just hear that question there. Who's broadcasting well? Yeah, there's going to, the DVD sales, the, the pre-sales started now and uh, uh, Jordy's FF, um, which is Jordy's fan film um, on Twitter. You should be able to find a link. Um, Zara sorting out the uh, the whole distribution system now. Um, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and do something different. We're going to try watch parties. We're going to try and put put a system in place that would allow a group of you to sit together, remote, but watch the. Um, so you would all get it broadcast to you, um, wherever you are, but also be able to interact with each other and very similar in a way, Steve. Well, you know, perhaps um, not in such broad terms, but some of the like the stuff that you've been doing with the commentary of the games. Um, or the, the, yeah. the interaction while the game's being played, but actually, while the game's on, people will be able to watch. So, it's just, we're working on something now with, with, a, with, with the technology that will allow us to do watch parties. Um, so, that, that's going to be interesting whether it, when it comes off, if, if we can get that sorted next week. And we're also talking to a, there's, a, there's a couple of, um, of the media outlets that are going to be putting it out. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till next week and maybe. Middle of next week, when we're when we're available, we can we can allow you to to then make the announcement of, of what's happening there if it's not already in the chronicle. 
um, yeah. because it's, it's vital that we do this do this correct. And what I would say is as well, people might remember, but when, I mean, I know it, it sounds ridiculous, but we, we asked people to just send their own fans filming. We said, you know, if you're at the game or if you're traveling away and, you, and you've got any footage or you want to create some footage, just film yourselves, film your pals, film you at the game, um, use, your, use your phone, um, film yourself, you know, film the action from the, from, you know, among you when there's a goal scored and that type of thing, the emotion. And we had hours and hours of footage for, for poor Zara and James and the rest of the production team to go through. But anyone whose fan footage is in the film will get a credit. So you may find that your fan footage that you submitted four years ago is going to have you getting a credit on this film. And that, that, that in itself is something that shows that, that this is about being a Newcastle fan and this is being part of something. We're all part of it. We were all in the ground or we all got excited you know, if, if we couldn't actually watch the game live, but we watched it on TV. If we couldn't get to some of the weird games during that season, but we... You know, we lived the emotion on, on the radio um, with with the great commentary from BBC Newcastle, which covered every game, etc. So you know, that 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 love story that 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 embellishes what we're all about, Steve. You know, yeah, it does. Well, let's um, without further ado, let us play uh, the the trailer which we've been kindly sent by Zara and James, uh, just to give you a little taste. For me, I say it's a challenge more than a problem though, because uh, you have to perform, you have to do well, and for our players, it has to be the same. So we have to go there with the idea that this is a normal game, try to get three points, but the atmosphere will be so hot that uh, we have to enjoy more than uh, have problems with that. I'm doing the song. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that that, and now I've got. It's no not a love yet. story to Rafa, by the way. It's not a love story oh. to Rafa. Before before we get slagged off about that little clip, that 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 is that Rafa was the manager then, so that's why it's Rafa Benitez. Please remember that, guys. That's why it's Rafa. <laughs> Wait, honestly, honestly, that alone just takes you back as if it was ten year ago, fifteen year ago. That's how long this like gap of having Rafa here, but also being able to go to the game is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's tragic, but look, we will be, we will be covering this more and more over the, uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks as it builds up to the launch. As you say, you can uh, find it on Twitter, um, which, uh, you know, basically Zara will load everything on there that, that needs to be loaded on. And they have got a, a website, which is linked to there. It's, uh, we are the Geordies.com dead easy. So www.wearethegeordies.com, uh, bookmark that. I'm sure there'll be more updates as and when Keith says, can I wait to see the We Are Geordies film? Just what we need at this time. I love the fact this film has a happy ending for Newcastle fans in contrast to Sun Sunderland the I Die series for SAFC. Uh, Dave, I didn't know your question. I will come to it. Steve, given your documentary on trolls, what's your view on Pretty Patel? Boris, not sacking her, effectively says to bullies, trolls and cyber bullies, it's okay. As long as you don't mean it, I say sorry. Yeah, I watch that with interest. And to be honest, when you start covering things like this, um, you know, you, you do start to hear more and more about it. It's it's weird when you when when you get your teeth into something. But um, I'm a man of my word. If I put myself into something, I'd do it. Had a very very productive week with the documentary. Um, estimated date of dropping that documentary onto YouTube and Amazon is going to be the 15th of December. It will be free. Um, we had a very uh, a very positive week. Uh, conducted five interviews this week. Um, some of them online. Some of them face to face. Uh, interviewed a couple of uh, well-known people on Twitter um, who have abused and been abused, I would say, is probably the right thing to say. And, um, you know, basically it'll be up to the viewer to decide what, you know, what they decide from, from watching it. Um, we've interviewed a school teacher from Sheffield and big Newcastle fan, Zubair, who um, is, uh, is is a Newcastle fan, has been since 95. He talks about the, uh, you know, the, the, the children at his school and, and how the, how social media affects them. Uh, we've spoken to another guy from Scunthorpe who set up a charity for mental health. Um, he's, he's on the documentary uh, talking again about being trolled and cyber 
abused himself after setting up something as positive as that. So, um, yeah, it's a couple more interviews to go. And uh, once we've got them done, it'll be down to the edit. But uh, we're expecting it to drop before Christmas. And that will uh, be, uh, you know, be interesting. I think people will enjoy it. Uh, as for me, things have calmed down. Uh, I did put me con- I did put my account on um, on lockdown, if you like, for, uh, for a week just while I was getting on with the document. But um, thanks for everyone's inboxes, messages, etc., and uh, positivity on Twitter. It's much appreciated, and um, you know we will just move on. As I say, it's part and parcel of it. And as I've said many a time, it's something I should have trademarked. When you put your head above the parapet, you're always going to get the negative. You're always going to get the negativity. It's nice to see the other people trying to use that phrase now and uh, pass it off as their own. But um, I suppose uh, imitation is, is a, it's a bit of flattery, isn't it, uh, Steve? I suppose it is. It is absolutely, Steve. There's nothing like being imitated and 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 you're being flattered by it. That's all I'll say. Seen a bit of that this week, uh, whether it's um, you know whether it's words or whether it's uh, things getting done. But uh, I'll leave that there. Dave Havery, um, so obviously your point on Pretty Patel, yeah. For me, you know, this isn't a this isn't a politics show, um, but ultimately it doesn't send the right message out. It it, it, it clearly doesn't. And um, you know, I think Boris has probably got. Uh, you know, too much on his on his mind with uh, the pandemic to to have to want to try and even attempt to sort that mess out. But he he does everything backwards, doesn't he? Uh, unfortunately, and um, you know we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic with for, with somebody who I've described on more than one occasion as an absolute buffoon. Um, to use Steve Howie's word, and I just think he generally needs um, maybe to to fall on his sword and pass it on. But I, I don't think we'll have to wait long. I think the swords are out, and I think um, I think we'll have a night of the long swords very shortly. And I think there'll be a, a leadership battle uh, at some point within the Tory party. But yeah, it's a mess, mate. That's that's my answer to that. Um, yeah, I mean. Basically, now we're, we're just going to look ahead, really, to the the next game, which is Chelsea. Um, I don't want to put it off too long because a lot of people want to talk about football. People do enjoy listening to our views on the on the political side of Newcastle, um, but we do want to talk about football. We've got a game against Chelsea tomorrow. It's at home. Um, obviously, it's a, it's an early kickoff, uh, half past twelve. Much to the uh, much to the disappointment, of course, of Frank Lampard, who uh, is moan and moaned and moaned about it on Sky all day. It's not going to change, mate. It's still twelve thirty on BT Sport. Um, the visitors, Chelsea, haven't won um, at St James's Park very often in the last seven games. In fact, they've just won once. Uh, Steve Bruce, of course, speaking to the media at his press conference today, confirmed that Callum Wilson could be involved after his hamstring problem. Uh, however, a sim- uh, the similar uh, injury which uh, Ryan Fraser has uh, sees him sidelined. Debravka, Gale and Shelby Dummett uh, all uh, sidelined still as well. Matt Ritchie is training, uh, but it does seem as if Saturday is going to be too early for him to play. Uh, Almiron, of course, returned from Paraguay late Thursday. And uh, Elliot Anderson uh, has been training with the senior squad, um, so could have a possible spot on the bench. But that remains to be seen. From a Chelsea point of view, Christian Pulisic and Kai Havertz are both uh, expected to miss the game. Both got fitness concerns. Thiago Silva might be back uh, for the Champions League fixture against Rennes on Tuesday, but he's not expected to feature. Um Ben Chilwell, we thought he might be injured after going off uh, with an injury for England. Seems as if he could have re- covered right tomorrow is Craig Pawson uh, and on VAR not that it really matters but uh, it's always interesting to know is Simon Huber uh, that's unless Liverpool decide to contact the Premier League and ask their <laughs> Newcastle's uh, VAR man to be changed but um, yeah so Chelsea 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 get home Steve normally it's a, it's a, a game we're all up for and we, we tend to get a bit of a result against Chelsea but there's no supporters and it keeps coming down to that. You know, there's no, no such home advantage in this fixture. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Hendrick's the big debate going on on social media at the minute. Um, would you play him? Would you drop him? What would you do? It's, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I, who are you going to drop him for? What, 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 what lineup are you going to get? Pop, we know, we know, that, we know the, the style of football that and, and the lineups that... And, and the, the formations that uh, that Bruce wants to play, and it, it, it's a case of well, who's going to come in, especially with the injuries, especially with like say, you know, you, you haven't got Richie, you haven't got Shelby, you haven't got Fraser. So are you are you going to stick both the long staffs in your midfield? Is Hayden coming back? Is that is that where Henry Hendricks is 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 struggling with? 
is he is he going to use the excuse that that the lad was away on international duty? I'm I'm not too sure. Um, the thing with Chelsea, I mean, I, c I can understand Frank Lampard's angst simply because I cannot understand why we've had an international break that's involved friendlies, that's dragged into three games, that and the way well, you used to have an international and it used to be a Saturday and a Wednesday, and that was it. Now we've got them on Friday nights, we've got them on Sunday afternoons, we've got them on Thursdays, and so it goes on. And, it, and it, all of a sudden we've now got this to, to, to get the Nations Cup in, to get the European qualifying in, and then stick a friendly in because you've got nothing else better to do. And I, I just I just think that you know, in, in, in this day and age that there's, there's Somebody has to look at this whole international saga of of dragging players all around Europe and all around the world at the same time, to and, and really you know come up with a solution because the, the the way that it's happening at the minute, and and it's no wonder. And but one of the byproducts of it, Steve, is that we we'll suddenly end up with the likes of Guardiola and Klopp to some extent, and certainly Frank Lampard and others, demanding five substitutes instead of three, and demanding nine on the bench instead of seven, and using the fact that the players had a, a shortage of, of pre-season, so that means they're getting injured more. And then the same managers don't use their substitutes, so they kill their own argument. It's mental. Football, football's gone crazy. It seems to be like a free for all now. You can come out with any old crap to try and justify your own personal situation and your own personal club's situation. And you know, one of the things I would scrap at a stroke would be having to stick managers in front of a camera a day, like a day or two days before a game, to come out with the same rubbishy eulogies about the opposition. And and you know what benefit does it do to hear Steve Bruce telling us like what a great team Chelsea is, and Frank Lockmar telling us how he respects Newcastle United or respects the manager of Newcastle United, um, or Jurgen Klopp coming out with some sort of eulogy about Manchester United that nine times out of ten the Liverpool fans are sticking their fingers down the throat when they hear it. Because they know it's just being said as a platitude for the TV. It's just to fill five minutes and to give people the likes of, of uh, Jim White and people like that something to talk about on Sky Sports. Just you know, this is where football is gone for me. This is where it's wrecked. This is and this is what's ruining it. This is what's ruining it. Go back to honesty. Go back to saying absolutely hate Chelsea. Go back to say absolutely hate Newcastle. I hate Man United. I hate Liverpool. I want to scalp them. I want to kill them. I want to destroy them. Instead, you get there and it's like, oh, I think they're a really good team and I think we're going to struggle against them today and all that crap, you know. Um, I respect that strikers. I respect that midfielders. Ah, it just does me head in, Steve. Rant over. <laughs> You're on two rants now. I know there's, a, there's there seems to be like a little side school of bets going on. How many rants you'll have? I think somebody took four earlier on. Mitch, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Hendricks debate continues, it rolls on, we seem to yeah. have this every week. My big concern, and it's a big concern of everybody in the chat, is Callum Wilson, is he coming back too soon? Is Bruce playing Russian roulette with our biggest chance of getting goals this season? That was the one thing I was going to talk about straight away when, you know, we are talking about right to start, is he's not got a good record of bringing players back with hamstring injuries just a bit too quick. Yeah. Uh, see also ESM, See also Andy Carroll, etc. See also Paul Dummett. You know, um, I, I, we don't seem to manage hamstring injuries well at all. Um, and players can say they're ready and say they're fit. But I think any player, if he feels that like he's got a chance to play, will want to play. Um, and, and is he being looked after properly? Because we lose Wilson for any long period of time, we're in big trouble. Um, so that, that worries me. That's a concern. Um, the only positive so far I can pick out is if Lampard's going on and on and on about this early kickoff, that that tells me that's the psyche in the dressing room. That's what's being passed around the entire squad. 
if the manager's whinging like that from the off, that must be happening behind closed doors as well. Um, and that's great. Because last time I looked, the kickoff times are the same for both teams. Um, and, and whether you've had half your squad away um, on international duty through the week or not, pity for your hump. You know, <laughs> it, that's part of the that's part of the game, isn't it? Is is it actually after all of our little wheeling and national teeth saying that both Darlow and Wilson should have had a call up? Frankly, I'm glad they haven't been dragged halfway around Europe. At risk of getting COVID and at risk of getting injuries over three games, and they have had Chil- Chilwell return to them again. A player who's had his injury problems from the start of the season and has just never seemed fit. Um, and they say, "No, no, he's all right." But I mean, he went off in that England game pretty damn quick. So um, I don't have any sympathy for somebody whinging away like that. Um, and and it's something that. If it's in their minds, I would put it in our players' players' minds. Hey, these this lot might be up for this today. You want to get it, get in at them early. Not that I, for a moment, think that's going to happen. Um, I can't see we're going all cavalier overnight. Um, I fully expect to see twenty five percent of the possession maximum. Um, Darlo looking like Spider Man and goal catching bloody everything he, he can. Um, I'm not hopeful for tomorrow at all. And I'm going to be, I've got a little bit of a flyer from work. I'm going to sit and watch it with, uh, with me mate Rob, who's a Chelsea fan, who I've mentioned, I think, on the Retro Show a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that should be interesting. Um, I was with them last night and we were talking about the game. We checked out a new sports bar actually here in Dubai. It was, it was quite good. The screens were fantastic and the pool was free, which was very, <laughs> very good idea indeed. Um, is that, a, is that um, a pool or is that a pool? Pool, as in, Pool table. <laughs> Aye. I'm picturing um, you going down in your speedos with your uh, Lilo and that, and uh, watching mate, the match. Wouldn't, the wouldn't be the first. Uh, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't wouldn't be the first time I watched the game from a pool here in Dubai. I have to say, you, 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 you get, it get in. you get moments out here. You know, you you think, what the hell am I doing? This is you know, it, this isn't normal behaviour. So yeah, it, it it's um, it should be fun. Um, to at least you know, go and watch with a mate who I spend quite a bit of time with. Um, yeah. Even though we're, we're both on different sides of the game, but I'm expecting yeah. him to have a bigger smile on his face at the end of the day tomorrow than me. Yeah, he's a good, it's he's a good a lad, Rob, as well. He's a good lad because I met Rob uh, when I was there early in the year, uh, and and he's one of those Chelsea fans that knows his stuff. He he knows his uh, game, he knows his club, and and. And he, he he's not the sort of lad who blows it, you know. He 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 genuinely likes to talk football, and he right. and he's a genuine article. He's a he's I, a I, smash I, kid. really is smash and blow. T- tell you the other thing, the connection to Steve there. He used to do the doors in Soho for a while, so he's got a million and one tears like you have, mate. That's right. <laughs> Quality, quality. Uh, Chippers, uh, Chippers has uh, made a comment here tonight. If I can just uh, find it again, he says, uh, "What's the odds that uh, Wilson pulls up with a hamstring?" And Bruce says, "Well, Callum pulled it after ten minutes, but we thought he could run we it. Thought off. he Chippers, could run it off. Oh, Jesus. Chippers, Chippers, never, a, never a better point made, son. A hundred percent agree." Uh, Steve, Neil Strager says, I would play both the long staffs tomorrow. I can't see Wilson being involved. Well, he is, by the sounds of it. Joe Linton will start up front 2-0 Chelsea. I think Wilson will be involved, unfortunately, but I hope you're all right. Yeah. Um, would you, Steve, would you play both long staffs? This has been something that most people have put on the chat over the, over the last couple of days, and it's, um, it's an interesting one. I mean, did, did they play well together? Would you play them together? <laughs> I'm not too sure. You know what? You know what? I, I always think that what a manager should be doing is he should be looking at his opposition and he should have players in his squad. And let's say what, like for example, we're playing Chelsea tomorrow, and you got right. Well, who's who's going to be playing for Chelsea? What's that midfield? What's that formation? And picking players that he thinks can compete with that formation and can challenge them and give them food for thought. You know, and I, I'm not. I, I always think it's not necessarily. I'm not seeing horses for courses or anything like that. But if you've if you've got a particular midfielder, for example, let's say let's let's use John Joe Shelby as an example, a, a midfielder who doesn't do that much running, who sits back in the quarterback position, 
But then you're playing an opposition with three absolutely super fast, flying, um, switching constantly midfielders. Would you get the best out of John Joe Shelby when he's competing against those? Or would John Joe Shelby be better when he's playing against a, a, another central midfielder who also sits deep? You know, is he better when, they, when they're playing Kante? Is he better because they're playing Kante? Because that eliminates him. They're, they're, they always play with 4 3 3. That's the formation. No, sometimes they'll, they'll switch to a three at the back and he'll have. He'll have five across his midfield, but it's not really five. It's, he's, he intermingles. And I think the, the thing with Lampard is he's not too sure what his formation is. I mean, we've seen them play very, very well and we've seen them play shockingly poor. Um, tomorrow, well, the first question was, can, can the two long staffs play together? Well, they train together. So there's no reason why, coaching-wise, you can't have... Um, a particular way one player is going to play in a particular way. Just because they're brothers doesn't necessarily mean... Because they're not they're two totally different footballers. You know, they're two, they, they play a totally different game. But just because they're brothers doesn't necessarily mean that they, they can't play together. Um, you know, I, I kind of play with our Jed because he's rubbish and I'm good. You know? <laughs> and that, you know, that's that's because I know he's watching. So I'm just having a little thing about yeah. that. You know what I mean? It, it, it makes no difference that the, the fact that they're brothers. Um, what what I'm saying is that you have to you have to Bruce has to be picking a team. He has to be looking at his opposition, and he has to have a tactics that can beat the opposition. Not just go out there and go right. Well, let's see how we get on. You know, let's see how we get on. Because by the time he comes around to change it, when the let's see how it's got on has failed or is failing, it's too late to change. Because like you're two now down or three now down. You know, so I, that's the part. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to criticise unduly because that, that's not what it's about. I, I think that I think that we've got a style of football that he'll not shake from, you know, and I think he'll play the same style of football tomorrow as we, we all anticipate, regardless of who the personnel is. You know, we'll play deep. We'll try and break, but we'll not have the cohesion to actually make it look very good and we'll get through or we'll get hammered and then we'll we'll use the we'll we'll look back and go, there was an injury, there was a sending off that cost for the game or whatever. Um we'll not be hanging on for grim death towards the end. You know, I I'll be amazed if that's happening, you know. Yeah, uh, because yeah. we haven't got the quality. We haven't got the quality. Uh, to manage it. Last season was great, wasn't it? I mean, that, that you know, I take them to nil-nil, gets the 94th minute, you get the, 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 the cross comes in the corner, it breaks, the cross comes back in, Hayden's there, a glancing header, the glancing, the most glancing of headers you've ever seen, and, and Hayden was surprised he even came to him, it's in the back of the net, and there was nothing they could do about it. You know, that's, that's is that what we're going to get tomorrow? <laughs> I'd be amazed if it's nil-nil. And we get to the 90th, 94th minute, to be perfectly yeah. honest. And we get a corner. <laughs> Mitch, what do you think about the long staffs? See, I've got a slightly different take on it in terms of if two professional footballer brothers can't play together, then that's a bad thing. For me, as pros, they should know each other and know each other's games very well. So if they can't play together, there's a, there's a problem. But is that a problem with system? You know, Sean seemed to make a real good uh, case for him being in that number 10 role last season. Uh, and and Matty certainly has the potential to carve a role out in the centre of midfield. And when people are talking about Hendrick, would, would putting Matty in for Hendrick be any worse? Um, for me, the biggest problem is what system is going to be in place if there's a system, what 11 is going to take the Take the take the field and what formation are they going to be asked to play? Because there just isn't any plan. And you know, if we had a rigid plan or had a way that were played and we had a set system instead of this, you know, names in a hat, positions on a on a on a dartboard selection policy that we seem to have, that then you stick with it for the next week if it worked last week. It's just absolutely um clueless on that part. So when you're bringing players in there. Do they really know what they're being asked to do? 
has there a system been applied? And and that's my biggest issue with it all at the moment is that we're not playing good football, we're not good to watch, our possession stats are low, and it seems to be making up as you go along in terms of system and position. And and so bringing two young lads into that, well, certainly in the case of Matty, a young lad, I don't think we've got to say the same show these days. Um, we're certainly bringing people into that system and then expecting them to to, to produce miracles is a real problem, you know? Um, the only, only, only one that you can uh, uh, sort of say um, that we're going to expect is we're going to expect to have a very low percentage of the possession. OK, we'll come to you for your predictions uh, in a minute, um, but before the end of the show. I've got to ask you about Rafa Benitez. Um, obviously, we've seen him on the uh, We Are The Geordies doc, uh, documentary uh, film uh, trailer that we showed a little bit earlier. Um, he was interviewed today uh, on BBC Radio 5's Live's EuroLeague show. Um, and the former Newcastle United boss refused to rule out a return to Newcastle if they are taken over by new owners. Um, he also distanced himself with links uh, connected to the Derby job. Interesting, interesting interview. Um, you know, you always take things with a pinch of salt. Um, but we do know um, that, you know, the Amanda Stavely consortium were, you know, keen, I suppose, on Rafa and, and keeping him in the job when, when these initial talks about taking the club over were, 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 were talked about um, way back in, what, 2017, Rafa was still at the club and, you know, he, he was, you know, talking about building a project and then obviously, uh, you know, eventually left the club and we ended up with Steve Bruce. What did you make of that, Steve, you know, with, with, with Rafa? He does seem to be holding on and uh, I would say, a lot of people say that about Pochettino, Steve, but... I would say Rafa would prefer to come back and finish the job he started. I would as well, to be perfectly honest. Um, wouldn't you? If you'd started yeah. something and you hadn't had the opportunity to finish it, Steve. You know, it's like, it's common sense, isn't it? You know, you you, you start something, you want to get in there, finish, somebody stopped you, uh, circumstances stopped you, um, that you didn't, you weren't getting the backing, but you've got the opportunity because you've still got the plan and you still want to be part of it. And you can see from what you know about the football club, what you know about the support, what you know about the region, and what you know about the potential that you'd want to have another go. That you'd, or more important, you'd want to carry on with what you had planned. You want to, you'd want to move those plans forward another two years with the backing that you didn't have previously to make this football club something special. And if you've got the confidence in yourself and your backroom team. And the backroom team includes the owners and includes the finance people and includes the rest of the club who you've got on board that you're going to have the personnel to be able to do it. Well, naturally, you'd want to, you know. And if you're still harboring any desire to be in the Premier League, that's where you'd want to do it. No question. It's, it's a no-brainer. And Derby County is just a flash in the pan. It's just a, it's just a passing... Uh, it's just a passing thing because they're they're immediately looking at it and they've already got rid of a manager and they've they've put four people in charge and that you know it's it's gonna you know look where they are Rafa's not gonna go there for God's sake he's he's Rafa's too good for that you know far too good for that if Rafa can't get a place in the Premier League which he's which he's looking out for then he'll he's he's still good enough to get a very very good top top class job in Europe without a shadow of a doubt okay what about you Mitch are you uh you know are you in the same mindset with regards to Rafa it was an interesting interview and uh yeah you know he's always careful what he says Rafa of course he is um you know the, the link to Derby is really easy because obviously it been I group um something we encouraged when, when Steve and I sat down with mid hat in February time um, we were our encouragement was to buy into his project. That was would, would be the way to go. We go back to Rafa and buy into the whole project concept. Um, but I know for for a fact that their their desire for Newcastle United was to look for somebody else and they had, had their own man in mind. 
and had that in mind in mind when the bid was happening. So um, I, it's it's easy to link Rafa to Derby. Um, have have the approach to my sport room. Genuinely don't know. It's funny. I took a little bit of stick from somebody who did this week saying, "Oh, why didn't you talk about Derby and how, how did you know about it?" Well, that, that's the same group you you shouted at for saying you spoke to too many people. Stop saying things. You know, it, it's ridiculous, man. Um, it, it it's it it is. It's an easy it's an easy uh, assumption to make. I think they need somebody very, very different. Their challenge is going to be initially staying in the championship because they're rock bottom and not looking really good. And, and good luck with them on that one. Um, so I, I, I can't see Rafa wanting to be there either, with due respect to it all. That situation is just, that nah, doesn't make sense. Would you come back to Newcastle? I think he's made that quite clear he would. I think he's made it quite clear not just himself, but through other intermediaries and people we've spoken to, um, that that is something you would you would listen to. Um, but he would he would need the reassurances that the the project was still very much doable. And so, you know, and and I know he's almost become divisive amongst the fan base a little bit of late um, because he, he he's he's an easy go to as a stick to beat. The club with and to beat Bruce with, um, but anybody who spent time with him and anybody who spent time in his company while he was at Newcastle United, and and again I think that comes across in Zara's film as well uh, about how much he gave him monkeys. And again, it comes back to what do we want as a fan base? We want people who care. We want people who absolutely give a shit, the same way we do, you know. Um and yeah, it wasn't always pretty. Um and it wasn't always great from a stats point of view, but it was far more effective in terms of getting uh, results than we seem to be at the moment, you know? Um you had more you had at least more confidence that you were gonna pick results up here and there. Whereas at the moment I think we're riding by the seat of our pants and getting away with a few things because of the situation with COVID and empty grounds. Uh, other talking points uh, this week have been the uh, the dementia, which uh, caused potentially by heading the ball. Dave Harrison says PFA have just called for no heading and training due to dementia concerns. And it's, it has been something. I mean, Alan Shearer did a fantastic documentary on this yeah. about 18 months yeah. ago, I think, uh, where he, you know, it wasn't it wasn't conclusive. But, um, you know, it's certainly something that be, people have been thinking about for, for a very long time. But um, I think the fact that a lot of the 66 team uh, seem to have, you know, Know, but coming down with dementia probably a lot, but of course, you know, back in the day, Steve, it was it was you know it was pigs' bladders which were soaking in water and um, you know heading one of them would it must have must have knocked. Do you know what I mean? To use a, a good old Geordie expression, but you can see how the damage has been done. Um, you know, and it is potentially you, you know something which which could affect it. I think they're calling for you know kids not to head the ball of junior football and things as if it's going to be a change in this, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the weight of a football's changed, to be perfectly honest. I think the weight of a football's always been 16 ounces or something like that. It's, it, so what, what's happened is that the way that a football is manufactured and what it's manufactured by has changed. And the, 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 the 16 ounces of a modern ball is, you know, 15 ounces of, of, of air, if you know what I mean, in, in, in that respect. But you're right. I mean, you, you talk to someone here, by the way, who, you know, couldn't have a bloody might have multiplex, you know, <laughs> like a deli, you know, I couldn't couldn't have a football, a toffee. I, you know, I, whenever I, I shut my eyes, me, I, I was an eyes closed, head the ball. And there's plenty of lads out there who are probably now going to come up on that lane. I can think of at least half a dozen of my mates who are immediately going to latch on and go, yeah, you're dead right. You were shit at that. You couldn't head a ball or toffee, you know. You didn't just close your eyes. You put your hands over your head like that as well, you know, because I just couldn't do it. It just wasn't me, you know. I just couldn't head a ball. I remember standing in the, in the garden with my dad as a kid, as a seven-year-old, with one of those leather footballs with the, with the, the, the laces up the side, you know, in 1966, 1967, and him throwing the ball and you heading it. I've got photographs in the house, of, you know, of that on the old slides and stuff like that. But they were heavy when they got wet. 
the, I bet you they weighed an awful lot more than 16 ounces. If that's, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that was the official weight of a football. Um, because they were, once they got wet, that was it. They became almost like a medicine ball, you know. Um, and I think as well, the training, you know, and, and, and it's interesting that, but, but I must say, I think that I think what the PFA have, have come out there, that, that statement that, that, that's obviously appeared, is a little bit half hearted. Because Gordon Taylor has reeled back on anything to do with dementia, investigations of dementia with footballers, uh, the situation with Jeff Astle, the way that they've kicked it, he's kicked it into the long grass for whatever reason, and I don't know what the reason's been, but for it to suddenly for him to suddenly come up with what I think, what I consider to be a half-hearted statement. Um, or just in training. Well, once you're not once you're not learning how to head a ball in training, then that's like sort of you know wh wh why didn't why why isn't the PFA coming out and going well we'll do it in the game as well, you know? So I, I, and I don't like Taylor. I don't like him. I don't I don't I don't respect the man. I I don't respect the way that he's gone on with the PFA over the years. I've, it's just something about him that that just has alienated me to him. But mm. PFA themselves need to take a, a strong look at the at the way that he has held a grasp on that organisation for what forty years now. You know, it's almost been, you know, it's like sort of how can I describe it? Uh, the PFA by Gordon Taylor. You know, if it was if it was a if it was a book, that's what you would call it, because he's 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 it's basically been his fiefdom, you know, and, yeah. and what says goes, and that that's not the way. It, and remember, the PFA is a trade union; it's the union of footballers. Whether you're in the, you know, the Division Two or the Premier League, whether you're an international or you're playing and and struggling on the breadline. This is your trade union, and they're supposed to help you, and they're supposed to support you, and they're supposed to be there afterwards and provide that after support. And I can understand, uh, and I, I, I watch with and, and read with with interest what Jeff Astle's daughter has done. And then you look, as you say earlier on there, about the the sixty six team and the number of people who have gone down with dementia and the struggles that their families had. Um, Great, great footballers, Martin Peters, you know, Nobby Styles. Absolutely shocking. And if this was America, and we know that, and, and, and anyone who, who, and Mitch is the expert on this, by the way, not me, but anyone who's watched American football and understands what that particular topic has done for that particular game, um, the Premier League's in for a, or the Football League is in for a massive, massive. I'm, I was going to, I was going to use a word there. I was going to use a phrase that probably I shouldn't do. A head f, it, because it's, it's, it's going to explode on them yeah, if they don't sort this problem out now. Very frankly, Mitch knows exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to the American football. Yeah, well, exactly, and. And other sports, to be fair. Um, there's a fellow of the European Academy of Sports Dentistry. Um, I can I can tell you the stuff that we've been involved with in terms of head injuries across multiple sports. Um, American football's obviously one close to my heart because I played for six years. Um, and I love the game. Great game. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the extensive concussion protocols they have now, and the research they've done into head injuries, and the links between head injury, um, concussion, dementia, and other other um, brain related diseases, um, and uh, your sport, Steve, boxing. You look at yeah. the, the, the the head injury. You know the the protocols that have for brain scans and head injury in boxing. Now, go to rugby union. We're doing research with American football and rugby union teams looking at the roles mouth guards can play in reducing concussion, for example which I could probably do an hour on myself right now. Um, and and so the, the, there's a lot of sports, a lot of contact sports, um, and a lot of non-contact sports. You can't step onto a basketball court as a college player in the US without a mouth guarding at the moment, for example. 
And that's basketball. That's no like the, the impacts and the contacts that we get um, in 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 other games. It's serious. We need evidence. We need more research. We need a hell of a lot more evidence. Uh, that documentary which uh, Alan Shearer did um, shows the kind of research that has been done to gather the evidence. Because evidence is the key to this. We need the evidence about what's happening so we can make the right decisions to protect players going forward in the future. When you get the challenge with something like, for example, looking at the World uh, Cup winning 11. Yeah. Um, if you want to look at the evidence of things like that, um, as humans, we try and look for patterns. It's a natural human thing. And actually, patterns and clusters are part of true randomness. And and that's why you need the right studies. That's why you need the right studies to say, okay, is this just a cluster that's part of true randomness? Or is this um, something that's actually connected? If you remember the big hoo-ha a, a number of years ago about power lines and cluster cancers around power lines, and and once they actually did all the data and the research, it showed it was there wasn't actually much evidence that linked it at all. Um, and a lot of these patterns were genuinely just part of true randomness. And that's why you need the data and the studies to get the statistics, to do the analysis, to say, okay, this this is what we should be doing. The um, minute you get authorities starting to get jumpy, though, the way the rugby union uh, bodies got jumpy just before, not the last World Cup, but the World Cup before. And they were suddenly pulling players out of games and introducing concussion replacement protocols and protocols on the pitch. At the same time, we had a German player playing 40 minutes of a World Cup final where he didn't know his own bloody name or what day of the week it was. Yeah. Um, and and this, these are the things that the game has to correct from on high. This is where people like uh, Michel de Hugo, the FIFA medical um, body, have to come in and say, right, this is what we should be doing as a game. These are the things we should be looking at and these are the things we should be introducing. Um, I get the concept of maybe removing heading from uh, below a certain age group, for example, but that would also tally with my thoughts about letting certain age groups play quick, small teams, one-touch football, express yourself um type of football that then produces better and more quality technical footballers in the way that Ajax have for years, for example. You know, I think you need to spend time going to see Ajax's academy and looking at what they do and then then transfer that and maybe look at at what age do you then start to introduce head. I mean, as somebody who went through various systems at Wall's End with a nickname of 50 pence head, I'm not really somebody who should be talking about <laughs> bloody head and the ball, to be fair. Um, 50 pence, mandelpiece head. Uh, exactly, you know. Um, so you know, I I, I get it. Um, but you, you know, you, you, it, it's the kind of stuff we need so much more evidence, and we need the game to be putting money into that, not letting it drain away through agents and things like that. The tie and the other conversations we've had tonight. Yeah, uh, don't don't say that my uh, designer John at QTechShop.co.uk lets the grass grow under his. There it is, head above the parapet T-shirt. Oh Christ! Uh, <laughs> already sorted. Already sorted for the food bank after we've done. After we've got the. Uh, after we have the winning bid on Monday for uh, for joining the dots. So there we go. Head above. That's great work, son. Uh, really good, mate. Uh, he's on the ball. Uh, but asking if we're doing match day live. Yes, we are. Uh, who will be on? Who knows? It's who gets in first. Uh, we usually have uh, me plus nine guests on, so we'll be starting that at midday tomorrow. Um, midday, as I say, at uh, uh, we'll be talking talking through the game and uh, looking forward to that. It should be uh, it should be a really good should, should be a really good uh, afternoon, um, which will be spoiled no doubt by the football. Uh, but yeah, tune tune in. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> tune, tune in at twelve. Tune in at twelve o'clock for that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I am having a rare day off on Sunday. And uh, as I see, I've already pre-recorded the interview with uh, John Altman. So uh, something a bit different, talking about uh, EastEnders and uh, various other things, uh, stuff that he's involved in, and uh, a new album that he's done. So. Uh, well worth tuning in for that. Um, it's a cracking interview, uh, about 45 minutes long. Uh, so that gets me a day off on Sunday. 
Uh, predictions and lads for tomorrow's game. Steve. Be too well. Okay. Mitch. 3 0 Chelsea. 3 0 Chelsea. Okay. I'm going to go for Steve Bruce having a little bit of luck again tomorrow. Oh, I, think there'll be, I think there'll be goals in it. I'm going to go 2 2. John's going 3-2 three, three, to Newcastle. I'm going to go 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, I think there'll be goals tomorrow. Whoa, Steve, where, where are we going to get two goals from? Two own goals from Chelsea. <laughs> 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 I, I hear the bottom of a barrel being scraped. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You know, definitely. He's on a Friday night. He's, he's changed <laughs> the tune, you know. He's been on the drink exactly. this afternoon, I think. Just on water, lads. As always, uh, anybody, somebody was asking where where they can get the uh, the calendar from for the food bank. It's from NewcastleLegends.com. So just type in NewcastleLegends.com. If you click the button tickets, it'll take you to the shop, and uh, that will essentially have our uh, mugs on. It'll have the calendars for the food bank, and it also has the t-shirts and the mugs as modelled by Daz. There you go. NUFC <laughs> matters mugs. Magic. Cracking, cracking mugs. Nice uh, <laughs> nice to have a cup of tea. A cup, like the a cup. <laughs> yeah, no, did you see it? Did you I, see I it? I thought that I. All yeah, right, Martin. Very, there you go. Brilliant. He did that deliberately. I don't know whether Martin's seen it yet, but I left it up a little bit longer there to see whether he'd seen it. And I'm pretty sure he, I'm pretty sure he did. But yeah, I'll be joined by the worldwide squad tomorrow for uh, match day live. As I say, that will be at twelve o'clock. So that should be, it uh, should be a good day. As you know, all of this month we have been running our own little campaign, um, which is phone a friend, call a family member or a friend that you haven't spoken to for a while. And uh, yeah, a lot of people have uh, supported us with this. So please do. Pick up the phone tomorrow. Give somebody a ring who you haven't spoken to for a while. Make that day. As I say, we are all still in lockdown. Um, and uh, thanks to Steve Hasty. Thanks to Mitch. We'll be back next yes, Friday. Yeah. Great stuff. And we'll play out with the video. Take care, lads. Cheers, Take everyone. Care. Good night. Mick Quinn here. And with another lockdown looming, you can understand why people are feeling down, a little bit depressed. Newcastle United fans, I'm back and phone a friend. So if you feel that way, pick up the phone, ring a mate, ring a family member, tell them how you feel. Get it off your chest and you'll feel a lot better. I'm back and phone a friend. I'm back and phone a friend. Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Caldwell and I'm back and phone a friend. What we've all got to do is stick together, family and friends. So if you're feeling a little bit low, a little bit... Uh, not positive about the outcome of the, the day that's coming up. Um, just pick up the phone, call one of your friends or family, little five, 10 minute chat makes you feel that bit more positive. Share your thoughts with uh, the person you're speaking to, but stay as positive as you can. We're gonna come out of this, and we'll come out of the better. So Lee Clark, the Cass United, I'm back in, phone a friend. All the very best. I'm back, phone a friend. Hi everyone, Rob Lee here. There we have it, another lockdown looming for all of us. Uh, it can be strange times, people can be very isolated, people feel very depressed. That's why I'm back in Phone a Friend. Liam O'Brien here, I'm back in Phone a Friend. I'm back in Phone a Friend. Please remember, these are very, very tough times for us all. And if you're not feeling well, you're not feeling confident, you're not feeling good, just phone a friend. I'm backing Phone a Friend. Good morning, this is Warren Barton. I just want to wish you a good day, enjoy your day. I know it's a difficult time for everybody at the moment. Uh, if you are feeling isolated, uh, feeling alone, uh, just reach out for someone. You're not on your own, whether it be a, a work colleague, a family member, next door neighbour, maybe even the guy in the, the paper shop. Um, just reach out to them, you're not alone. Um, we know we want to try and support our team and concentrate on something else but at this difficult time uh, just reach out for someone there's someone there to support you and I wish you all the best take care I'm back and phone a friend <laughs>